Georgia might have a problem. And what will the game look like for Alabama if Bryce Young can't play against Texas A&M? And finally, after wandering in the wilderness for generations, being a non-factor, finally a program that has come to the light and in to the present as a power. No, I'm not talking about Kansas. I'm talking about David Pollock's internet. This is the College Game Day podcast for Wednesday, October 5th. Reese Davis, Pete Thamel here, and the great David Pollock has joined us wearing a baseball hoodie, which makes me proud. And then in addition to that, for the first time in all the years that I've communicated with David via internet, I can actually see him, and he doesn't look like, uh, for people of a certain age, that old cartoon character, Max Headroom, where he's going, yeah, but, yeah. (laughs) Pollock, what's it like to have internet that you don't hear, beep, 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 before it starts? Like, Donald, what's that like? uh, It's pretty fun. It's it's pretty pretty phenomenal. It's amazing. Like, I'll show the first thing me and my wife did. We're like, watch this. When you click on the link, it comes up. Like, this is awesome. How cool is this? (laughs) So... It's the simple things in life, um, but no, I, I have not started Reese. Uh, I've not started video gaming yet. I'm saving that till after the season because Lord knows I'll be up till two or three a.m. like this, glued to a screen. So I'm gonna keep gluing myself to to tape for the time being. But it's it's a lot of fun. The kids appreciate it too. Pete, you can't imagine. I mean, maybe you can. You've done a few of these. You can't imagine what this has been like for the last few years. For I don't know how he watches all the tape that he does. Um, I mean, it's probably has to come through almost like one of those, you know, those cartoon things when you draw different cartoons in the corner of a, a stack of paper and then you flip the paper to make it look like it's moving. That has to be how he was watching tape before. So knowing David only a short period of time, he sort of like craves this like caveman simplicity ethos. And I'm wondering if this really conflicts with that, David, like, like, this like takes you a little bit out of your like simple human mode. Pete, I would answer that, but I don't know what you're talking about with caveman <laughs> ethos and all that crap. So if you want to talk well, about football, you can you Google it now football. and get an answer very quickly. <laughs> come on, come on, David. No, you're not fooling me. Tell tell them answer the man's question. You know what it means. <laughs> no, it's it's definitely um I mean, I think you definitely take pride. I definitely take pride in having cows as neighbors. Like I I thoroughly I thoroughly enjoy that, um, and, and I take you know pride in being a barbarian in a three technique, as, as noted on game day every week. That yeah. Reese and them just, I'm not a fancy guy, you know. I'm just more of a put my hand in the dirt kind of a guy. I'm not going to wear dress shoes much to Reese Davis's chagrin, um, but but it is what it is, baby. You know, didn't you tell I, me a famous story about you grabbing a steak with your hand at a restaurant? Oh, this is an amazing. This is an amazing <laughs> story. Which, yeah. by the way, because he, Pollock teases me about being, you know, I don't know, more refined. What Pollock High did with the, would be a good word. Highfalutin, maybe. But what Pollock did with the steak, completely on board with. Tell him the story, Dave, what you did with the steak. Um, I, I, was, at, I was at a restaurant, um, a really nice restaurant in, in, in L.A., and we were with a bunch of our colleagues. And a steak was sent to the table, and it was not the liking of one of our colleagues, which is absolutely fine. No big deal. Like, send it back. That's your It was that's your deal. It was that's foul. your deal. Um, <laughs> that's your deal and how you like your food. And I agree. You should get what you pay for. But I did ask the, the young lady. I said, what are you going to do with the steak? And um, she said, we're going to throw it away. And I was like, well, no, I'll take it. I'll gladly eat it. Um, and, and one of my colleagues was like, absolutely not. You do not do that. Like show a little bit more cooth than that Pollock. And I'm a barbarian, like we, like we discussed. And I was like, so I reached out with my bare hand and I grabbed the steak and I bit into it. And I was like, that's a free steak. So I will absolutely eat that. All right. But so there you go. So were there like <laughs> shocked executives at this table? Like, um, Probably it's probably, I mean, I'm probably surprised I still have a job, but that's okay. It was a really good steak and it didn't cost me a dime. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember um, what restaurant you were at? I'm the annoying reporter asked for details. Swimmings. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. A little I mean, different than like the red light, green light Brazilian place. Yeah. Oh, right. Fogo de Chao. Doesn't get better than Fogo de Chao. Oh, so it did some damage there. I mean, we're I guess having... they have those in Kansas, huh? 
We should yeah. ask right now, while we're in this line of thinking, where our barbecue should come from this weekend. I, I have not been to Kansas a time. I've been a handful of times. I haven't been enough to have refined barbecue opinions. I know, Reese, you've been there a lot for game day hoops, so maybe you you know. But uh, I've, I've been there a ton, but I'm going to be honest with you. We haven't hit the great barbecue place. Now, what I'm told is there's a place in a gas station in Kansas City, more so than in Larrytown. That is the the place to go, and I'm sure our listeners can can give it to us. Did a us certain ESPN staff member say fathers and sons went to the gas station in Kansas <laughs> City after the comma? <laughs> I'm I'm not going to comment on that, but possibly I don't know. I mean, <laughs> oh man, <laughs> off the rails! I love it. The best podcast ever uh, gets sideways early. So if you're tuning in to hear football. Pollock's got new internet to evaluate football. I am completely unperturbed, uh, informal usage for Mr. Wordsmith Pete, nonplussed perhaps by Georgia's uh, struggles. I don't, I don't think he's a big deal. I think it's a simple case of sleepwalking and knowing they're better than the last couple of teams they played. And it's just not a big deal. David Pollock, your thoughts. Well, okay. Here, here's what I'll say about that. I might agree that they didn't – I don't think they've taken their last couple of opponents like they should, but I also think there's something to be said about that. That means there's a lot of youth. Like, that means there's immaturity on the team. Like, when you look back at last year's team, I think one of the most important things or one of the things we, we looked at the biggest, we were like, dude, these are a bunch of grown-ups. Jordan Davis, you know, all these guys that are going to stay in – Devontae Wyatt, they're going to stay in line. They're going to stay on task. They're going to stay focused. N'Kobe Dean, they're going to cover the small things that are very important to win. I think now you got a lot of youth. And what happens with youth? You wake up. Some days you feel good. Some days you don't. Some days you really want to play. And some days you don't. Some days you're really motivated. And so I, I don't think it speaks well um, for the maturity of the team. For, for I think it, the offensive line got absolutely manhandled, which is a big problem. You need balance. You've got to be able to run the football. I think there's an issue at, at left guard. I think um, – you know, they, they got to find – they've got a bunch of running backs going. I think they need to find their best one or two maybe and stick with their best one or two. Uh, I thought Stetson played okay. But the defense gave up – I think the defense gave up like 200 yards on six plays, something like that. And the rest of the game, they gave up, you know, a small number of yards per play. But I think it has something to do to, with focus for sure, Reese. But I also think this says something about your maturity level, about your leadership and – um, you better get that stuff figured out down the road because if you don't feel like playing all the time, you're going to get your hiney with it. So, you know, as we've sort of crafted the narrative of Georgia attempting to replicate Alabama's consistent dominance, and they have a long way to go, I want to be clear about that. But after that Oregon game, I, I among many people, were like, oh, okay, maybe they can just roll this out after, was it 17 draft picks, David? 17 NFL draft picks? 15? Yeah, 16 or 17. It was a record. Yeah, 16 or 17. It was a record. They had more players drafted than any team in the history of college football. So it's like, can you just roll this out again? And the thing that I've always found the most fascinating about what Saban has done as Alabama is he's talked about fighting human nature. And I think we're seeing human nature creep in to, to, to Georgia. You look at Bullard's arrest a couple of weeks ago. You th you look at like the classic symptoms of success, disinterest in games, struggles in road games that you should dominate on paper um, and just youth, youth on the field, inconsistency that, that, that comes with it. So I really feel like that is one of the, that is the, the talent is there. I don't think there's, there's a huge, uh, you know, crisis of talent. There are some spots, there are some things that need to get better. Um, but I really feel like human nature is George's biggest enemy right now. You know, Lou Holtz used to tell me all the time, you do not have the same football team from one week to the next. You get a different team every week. And that <laughs> that is especially true for guys that aren't, well, they are professionals in a way now, but they're not, they're not mature professionals. And, you know, I'm not worried about it at all because it almost, it almost helps because – you can now go back, not just to coaches. I'm not really in it. We overestimate this. Boy, Kirby's going to really be mad and have stuff to use. Now, the players take some individual pride in performance, and they can look and see, that wasn't great that I that I got dominated in my one-on-one -on -one matchup. You know, if you're an offensive lineman at Georgia, you didn't run the ball uh, as effectively as you could. That's going to challenge your pride in performance. And, you know, the one thing, 
that if history tells us anything uh, with the game Georgia has coming up this weekend in the Deep South's oldest rivalry, which when they play will be the second most played rivalry in the sport, is that Auburn is likely to get a double-digit lead and blow it because they've done that in five consecutive SEC games. I'm not sure they're going to be able to get that on Saturday, David. What do you think? You know, I, I'm still – I thought Ashford played a heck of a ball game the other day. I thought yeah. that was the best he'd looked. Um, you know, he was he was on point. Um, I thought LSU kind of did a little bit of the Georgia, too. I thought they were pretty immature coming out and weren't as focused and locked in. I think they thought they were going to roll. I think they probably listened to game day and saw everybody say, hey, it's going to be a curb stomping and LSU is going to, you know, go flatten them. I think there was some of that. Um, but I, I, Auburn is just – I don't know what Auburn is. I mean, I just – Oh, it's just it's it's a frustrating watch. It's like even even play calling now when, when you go for it on fourth down, you know, midfield with, you know, three or four minutes left in the ball game when I think you could punt or you could, you know, I, I, I decision making, you know, take, I talk, like I talked about on game day Saturday, Tank Bigsby not getting, you know, a, a, a bunch of carries at every single game and riding him as much as you possibly can. So I don't have any faith in Auburn, but I, I think you'll see a better version of Georgia. Yeah, maybe so, David. He. He hasn't he hasn't been able whether it's offensive line issues or whatever he hasn't done anything in their in their last three games and I'm talking about yards per carry most of his production has come against Mercer and San Jose State now is that because I I, I assume and from you watching the tape you would know better than I but I assume most of that is because nothing else Auburn has or maybe Hunter too Jarquez Hunter is a good running back nothing else Auburn has really scares you so no. the, so the better teams are going to say okay four's not beating me. If you're going to do something, nine Robbie Ashford is going to do it. He's going to have to throw it or run it himself. I'm not letting Tank Bixby beat me because he's the only guy that can. And as a result, uh, in the in the SEC games in Penn State, he hasn't he hasn't been able to do anything. I think it's a couple of reasons. One, your offensive line struggles. That's number one and most importantly. Now you couple that with quarterback play that's a struggle. I mean, obviously, there's not a lot of space for Tank Bigsby. Here's the thing. I, I, I get that, Reese, but he's still my best player. He, he He's my best player. It is my job to find a way to manufacture him. Fair enough. It. No matter yeah. what that yeah. looks like, no matter what that is, whether I'm throwing him the ball in the backfield a little bit more, whether I'm putting him in the slot and running jet sweeps, whether I'm running speed options, it's, that, that's my job. That's, that's the offense's job to continue to find ways to get your by far heads in a way best player of the football as many times as you can. My point was not not that to not do it. My point was that it's not working that great. That yeah. I mean, maybe other, that's my point is not to go away from Bigsby because the defense wants to stop it. My point is it's not really working. You know, so uh, do we think this is it for Harson if they get run out of uh, Athens? Who knows, man? I mean, it's uh, probably. Pete, isn't that your job? But who knows? Your it is. Job, it is. Yeah, but it's Auburn, know. man. I it, predict predicting Auburn when you don't know who's in charge is always a little bit dangerous. I I think there's a really good chance if the result is lopsided. I mean, yeah. it, they've become sort of a caricature of themselves at this point at Auburn because, like, it is a matter of when Brian Harson gets fired, not if. So. Um, there have been there was a window last week to do it, especially after the way the play calling went in the second half. They, they passed. The, the interesting part of the dynamics of firing Brian is that he's the play caller and there's no obvious interim on staff. Right. So, yeah. like, you know, do you, do you make Zach Etheridge the, the the head coach who's kind of one of your young, one of your own Auburn guys who, who I would say, you know, sometimes guys do this like USC maybe to save the recruiting class or to keep recruiting momentum going. They have the worst recruiting class in the SEC. They don't have any. Yeah. So, yeah. So, it, it, that doesn't seem to be a factor, but – like you still have to coach six games at this point. That's a, you know, that's a very, that's a, that's a long time. There's some, you know, there's some pretty high leverage, uh, you know, high leverage games left. It, 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 that's not a place that just wants to wave the flag. And I don't know the staff well enough to know who would call plays. Um, and they're all his guys too. Like yeah. Harson doubled down on himself after the coup attempt last year. And, and I get it. Right. But you know, when the, the way the staff was redesigned, it was people he's comfortable with. So that dynamic's interesting too, because you're, you know, there's only, you know, there's two or three kind of outsiders, but the rest of them are sort of his, uh, his maybe a little more than two or three, but not many, but, but the rest of us is hardcore guys. So how does that right, one, dynamic play out? One final, one final thing on Auburn, Georgia, Georgia's won five in a row. It's the longest streak 
since Auburn won six in a row in the 50s. <clears throat> Historically, this is a back and forth series. This could be, to your point about dismissing Harson, this could be very much like the Wisconsin Illinois game. Not maybe not to that level of vitriol, but because of the rivalry and the intensity, if they get embarrassed in that rivalry again, um, then that may be the time to move. David, I want to go to another game, but because you played in it, give me your best Auburn Georgia story from when you played. Dang. Um, don't so tell I, me about, don't tell me about a swim move. I want something fun. Something fun. I'm not very much or, fun. What did you, okay, did you, I got did you ever, did you blow up Jason Campbell? You played against Campbell and, and Ronnie Brown. and Ronnie Cadillac. Brown. Ronnie Cadillac Brown and was, Cadillac. Yeah, they, they were. That was a good team, know, man. Whew. I, you know, this might be not be the right time to tell this story, um, but it's a really good one. So I'll tell it to you. Uh, <laughs> this is probably the wrong climate in the world with what's going on with head injuries and stuff. But <laughs> we were down big to Auburn and I got dinged really good on one play. And we needed to win. This was back in 2002, 2003 season. And we really needed to win. And we came out in the second half. Ronnie Brown had murdered us in the first half. And we came out in the second half and we started to stuff them. And I got a little bit dinged up. Well, back in back in the old school days, the trainer would come over and they'd give you a couple numbers to memorize. Like, hey, remember these numbers. And, uh, and then they'd come back to you like a couple minutes later. And I can just tell you from where I was at, I had no shot. Okay? I had no shot to remember the numbers so I grabbed one of my one of my teammates and I'm like bro listen go write down these numbers 34 24 17 <laughs> I remember the numbers now uh 34 24 17 I was like dude go write it on your hand and when he comes up to ask me those numbers you hold that flipping hand up so I can see it and so I can be perfectly fine um and, and he did but that was that was that was the game and the finish with – that ended up being Michael Johnson fourth and 16, remember, and, or yeah. fourth and 12, him catching that touchdown and going absolutely ballistic. And the first time we won an SEC championship in 20 or 30 years. But we had got donkey stomped the first half, our defense. And we were a really good defense. And then came out in the second half and played really, really well. So that's, that's probably my best story that I shouldn't tell in light of what's going on with the world of concussions. Yeah, that, that, that gives that a is good environment, too, right? David? That you that you played in, I I love that environment at Auburn. Is that I you, oh, you played awesome. in all the event? Yeah, it's, it's cool. so great. It's it's uh, Jordan Hare. You know, it's a it's a great atmosphere. You know, the the Eagle, the introduction. I mean, the fans are. I I honestly feel at this point in my career, I feel bad for the fans because the fans are better than the team and the program in which they run itself. I mean, they they stick by their team. They're always there. They showed up. They show out. Like it's such a great. I mean, we've been to them all, Reese. Like. It's one of the best ones in, in all of college football. I mean, they just love their team. That's why you hate all the dysfunction and the losing that they got going on now because it shouldn't happen. Yeah, that's that's a great way to put it. The fans, the um, I was on Fine Bomb yesterday and sort of, you know, the rank and file fans. I don't mean that dismissively. I just mean the average average people, you know, who do their jobs, have their families every day and love Auburn football. They're great and they're loyal and they stick and, and they deserve better. They deserve to have the program run better than it's been in recent years. David, from your film study, what changes? Because did you guys notice? Now, I didn't watch every piece of it. I saw a clip. Alabama sent out practice video of their wide receivers catching passes. But we don't know who was throwing the passes. Ah, so now the odds makers are saying that Alabama's a 24-point favorite against Texas A&M. That would indicate that perhaps Bryce Young will play. Um, but maybe not. If he doesn't, when Jalen Milrow gets the start and goes, what's what changes? What's the biggest change for Alabama? Other than the fact well, that, that the dude runs like, you know, Mike Vick or somebody. Well, just think think Jalen Hurts versus Tua Tungavaloa. That, that to me is a good comparison because the offense becomes now predicated on his ability to, to, to run zone read. Hit, like – Think about the biggest plays in the ball game from when he took over. He goes 77 on a scramble that was awesome. I mean, gets to the middle of the field, breaks some ankles, goes. Um, you think about when they got backed up in the red area a couple times. What what happened? I don't think this happens with Bryce Young. They run a screen to Gibbs. He takes it down to the two, a holding penalty. He comes back. They throw a screen to JoJo, and he scores. So I, I think it becomes a more run-heavy offense. I don't think it's a surprise either. You know, uh, Jabari Gibbs had a 270-plus yard runs 
with Milrow as a quarterback. I, I think it makes the mm -hmm. offensive line a little bit better because now the backside has to really play the run. Are, is the passing game better? Heck no. I'm not stupid, okay? The ha passing game takes a big hit in what they're able to accomplish, but the running game becomes – a lot more dangerous. Um, you know, they, they can do the time of possession thing. They can I, – I, the 24 with, with, with Milrow – now, listen, you're playing A&M, and they struggle to get four passes completed in first downs, which is really hard. You know, that's, that's not really good for your, for your team. But I don't think Alabama's as, an explos as explosive as an offense, especially through the air, but it's very different in how you defend it, and I think the running game would accelerate big time with Milrow. So I'm gonna I'm gonna throw a little quarterback wrinkle in just to be uh, to be a bit of a contrarian here. Two years from now, Ty Simpson and Connor Wigman are going to be the faces of college football. So Ty Simpson is the third string mm -hmm. quarterback at Alabama. His father is the coach at UT Martin. Connor Wigman is a good enough recruit that when Quinn Ewers went in the portal from Ohio State, Texas A&M was like, "We're good, we're good, we got our guy." So in terms of pure quarterback talent, Connor Wigman is the best quarterback at Texas A&M. Apologies to the Max Johnson bandwagon on the uh, crisp internet zoom on my, uh, on my screen in front of me. Um, <clears throat> and Ty Simpson certainly is not better than Bryce Young, but is the, is probably the face of Alabama future just in terms of long-term. He's as highly regarded a quarterback recruit as Nick Saban has got there. So just if that game gets weird on Saturday, which when you're dealing with, you know, you you have two unknowns starting, you know, potentially starting a quarterback, right? So just those are interesting names for, for now, for the future, but maybe for a cameo on Saturday. If Jalen Milrow, if they need to throw the ball, and that is not what Jalen Milrow is, is best at in terms of downfield passing. Now, he's obviously, obviously anyone who flipped on the Arkansas game can see his skill set, and it's, it's a high-end skill set. But it would be interesting to see – if all of a sudden those those guys get in the mix, I know at Texas A&M, they really feel like Wigman's the best quarterback in that room. And Now, do you roll him out for his first career start in Tuscaloosa? Probably not. That would be foolish. But I do think that if that offense continues to be the biggest slog and the biggest disappointment in the sport, Jimbo needs to be in the business of hope because there is not much hope right now for that A&M offense, and I think Wigman represents it. Okay, but – I don't know how to say this without, you know, and listen, Jimbo makes mean, 90 million. Okay. Jimbo, right. Jimbo, Jimbo makes $90 million. So I guess I don't need to be sensitive to Jimbo's feelings for goodness sakes, but Jimbo's got to do some reevaluation on what he wants to be offensively. I mean, I think that, I don't think there's a quarterback in the country that's going to be very successful with the pieces they have on offense, lack of a deep threat, Anaya Smith out. You got the best, one of the best running backs in the country in HN. That dude is an animal. Your offensive line is kind of figuring itself out, but again, play calling, what you are, what your identity is. And, and again, I, I think Jimbo has done a great job in his, in his life when he has certain pieces. When he has certain pieces, I think Jimbo's a, a phenomenal offensive coach. I want to see Jimbo Fisher do this and mold to his pieces. Whatever he has, he needs to find a way to make it successful. That's his job. And I think, you know, if you put Wigman in the game, He's going to have the same result as Max Johnson. He's going to have the same result as Haynes King. He's going to struggle his flipping tail off, especially against a team like Alabama. So I don't know that you help him and you and you give any future hope against Alabama this week. Now, maybe down the road if the schedule lightens up like crazy, but I, there's not a lot of that going on. I think A&M's looking for uh, wins at some point, hopes, the recruiting class now, all that momentum that – that Jimbo had in the off season and last year is tanking the other direction. You need to find a way to create more momentum. Cause here's the thing. What, what has everybody done for years against Kirby smart? Well, they're not going to throw it. Well, you don't want to be a weapon to go there. What is everybody going to do to A&M right now? Like, look at that offense. You want to go play that offense? Look at that offense the past couple of years. That's what, that's what you want to hit your wagon to. Like, I know you're going to get money and you're going to get NIL deals, but is that what you're going to go to the NFL and that like, I'm just telling you what recruiting will look like and what people will be saying behind closed doors. And how about how about this? Jimbo has, has to give up play calling. Do you think that like to to evolve as David says? Do you think they need an offense coordinator who calls plays and he needs to just accept his degeniusing? Either that, or and I, Pete, you and I have talked about this a couple of times, and I'm I'm going to bring it up again because I thought it was a really insightful point. 
And I'm going to go ahead and, and take away what Pollock is going to zing me with immediately. Clearly, it's not working yet for David Shaw. But it's a smart thing. to It's a smart way to think about things. He was talking about how much of my institutional knowledge of what Stanford should look like is still valuable. You know, so he's made some changes. Haven't worked yet, uh, you know, for sure. But the philosophy of evaluating that is smart. And that's what Jimbo has to do, in my judgment. If he is not willing to do that, then yes, he probably he probably does need to change and give up play calling. But if he is willing to say, how much of my institutional knowledge of what a Jimbo Fisher offense, what what the quarterbacks are supposed to look like, what the tempo should be in this in this uh, era of college football, uh, what type of quarterback I should have, you know, those types of things. If he's willing to look at that and sort of overhaul his belief system, keep what works for sure, because he hasn't just suddenly forgotten how to develop a quarterback or, or orchestrate an offense. It's like like. He doesn't know how to do it in the modern era. He just needs to figure out what's holding him back. What's keeping him from evolving and taking the next step and being explosive the way they used to be when, you know, in his LSU offenses and his Florida state offenses. I know the cynics are going to say, well, he had Jameis or, you know, or well, he had EJ Manuel, you know, but still, I mean, I think he needs to look at that. And if he's willing to reevaluate that institutional knowledge, great. If he's not, he probably needs to give up the reins because this is not, it's not good enough. Uh, when you consider this, and I'm a little higher on Milro as a passer eventually. He's a thrower now, but he, he's going to polish. He's already improved. But consider this. Jalen Milro comes into the game. Granted, Arkansas has some defensive problems. They put 35 on the board with Milro at quarterback. A&M hasn't scored that many points all year. They, you know, they haven't, they haven't top 31, I don't think. Certainly haven't in, in, against an FBS opponent. So I, I think there's some reevaluation. No, 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 we, we need to circle back real quick to the, to the first point because you said I'm going to kill you. Did you just use a uh, one in three Stanford team as your analogy? I knew it. For See, how, how well do I know this guy? Better? I mean, how well do I know? Hey, guys, fans, like. I just want you to focus on David Shaw's Re- re- reinventing himself as a one in three team. You, you can didn't say reinventing year. himself. You can do that he said eva- really hard. He said evaluating institutional knowledge because sometimes you get so – we see it in every walk of life. You see it in your personal walk. What you, you, you decide, you look and say, okay, how do I need to evolve and change? And am I willing to do that? If you sit on your bed in the morning, I heard a wise man say and say, what are the stupid things that I'm doing to hold my life back that I could change right now? And the man I heard say this wise dude said, you better be ready for the answer, man. If you really want it, you know, you better be ready for the answer. And not many people have the capacity to to do that. And all I'm saying is that Shaw has at least shown that. But yeah, it's no, still been, and the only thing that's the only the only thing that's been on the airwaves uh, more than me reciting how many weeks it's been since Stanford has beaten an FBS opponent is the ads about how toxic the water is at Camp Lejeune. But other than that, you know, I mean, I mean, I say it every week, and here they have a, another chance. But okay, let's put a bow on this. With I shouted fun. you down, David. I'm sorry because I know you so well. I knew where you were going. Oh yeah. Let's do some fun, baseless speculation of who A&M could hire as a coordinator. And this is uh, I, I'm going to I'm going to just go off the top of my head off of like partially just due to by eyeball bias from game day this year. Could they hire Kevin Barbet from App State who won in their stadium with a great game plan and has shown some diversity? Could they hire Andy Kotelnicki from Kansas who has little old Kansas barnstorming through the Big 12? Could they do they go full heel and go Zach Kitley from Texas Tech? That's who I was going to say. And go and go ten thousand miles an hour. I mean, you know, maybe Kendall Bryles, he fits in that he fits in that realm too. Do you, you know, do you do you puncture your West rival who should have beat you um this year and, and take away a prize? I don't know. It there with a new hire comes a new identity and an embrace that you're gonna be different. So, and those three are all pretty different in, in how they, uh, you know, in how they operate, but it's, it will be very interesting to see if they, if Jimbo does take that step, how he chooses to evolve. How about, how about your guy, Alex Golish at Tennessee? 
yeah, he'd be, he'd be great. I mean, shoot, he's, uh, you know, he's got them, he's got them rolling. I would think if they kind of run through this thing and, you know, or in contention in the East and play George and Bama tough, I would think he starts getting mentioned for like Mac jobs and AAC jobs. I, there's one thing about hiring guys from that, that type of tree. And it's like, it was like Tennessee's hyper of high Tennessee's higher of hypo, which I really liked. It was like, you know, exactly what you're getting. You got somebody to coach the quarterback. You know what your offense is going to look like. And at the end of the day, it may take you a while to win big, but you're going to score and fans are going to like it. Like there's something to be said for, it was like what Sean Lewis did at Kent state. They said, we are going to be fast and this is our identity. And we're going to grow into that recruit to it. It's distinct. So you know, those are all. Uh, you know, those are those are all I just, interesting. I, I, it just makes me chuckle that that y'all picked air raid offense, like with uh, with with Jimbo. Like just to think about Jimbo's head and the way it would explode because he's always been like, I'm. It's a progression guy. You know, you go through your progressions and it's like, no, 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 catch, spin, and then you talk about Kansas. You talk about basically a spread option running attack, like just un Jimbo Fisher. I, I just would love to see. But here's the thing. I, I know this. I know that they need more voices at, on their coaching staff that have a say on the offense that are that are my, that are good offensive minds. They need more of that if they want to be successful. You, and David, I think you bring up a, a great point because all of this sounds good in fantasy football. Your coordinators had better be aligned with what the head coach believes because if if it's not and he starts tinkering with things, it can invite disaster. I remember a story, uh, you know, the great Gene Stallings, when he was at Alabama and they needed him to open up the offense, he hires Homer Smith. And he's going through Homer's playbook, and he's like, I like this play, but we're not running that one. And Homer's trying to tell him, but coach, you, we have to, we got to run the play you don't like, or you, yeah, you play you don't like in order for the one that you do like to work better. So, that's the type of thing you can run into if you hire a guy that you don't really believe in. If you're sort of urged, I don't know if anybody can force Jimbo to do anything, um, but urged, he acquiesces and hires someone out of that tree. He better be all in or else he better just evaluate himself and how he can get better at, at what he does. You guys know that uh, this is the first time ever that Kansas and Kansas State are ranked Texas and Oklahoma aren't so we're going to Kansas can't wait to get there it's going to be going to be a blast we had no business going there for the Duke game but now they've earned it and this they're the story right now TCU is a pretty good story too Pollock does it does it come to an end does the clock strike midnight for rock chalk on Saturday afternoon against the frogs yeah I think so unfortunately I hate to be the pair of I think of, of, of bad news. I, I love, I love Kansas. I, I love what they've done. I think Daniel should be right now. If you're talking about Heisman, like in the Heisman discussion and you take off all the uniforms and you, and you watch who's been playing, like, I think I would have a couple of guys that probably most people don't have a, as their front runners, you know, slash guys that I would put at the top of the Heisman ballot right now. And he's one of them. I mean, he's just been, he's been dynamic. He's been electric. And, and by the way, the whole offense has run through him. Like it's it's about his mobility. It's about his decision making. It's about what he can do. But and and you watch Kansas as well as their coach. But I just think TCU explosiveness is stupid. I mean, I think they've got. I mean, they can do so much offensively. They have so many weapons. They got a quarterback in Duggan who he's not a he's not Daniels with the way he runs, but he runs it well enough and physical enough to even to keep it even more. Um, dynamic. They can run the football. They can throw it. I think they have more balance, which is which is you know Kansas isn't going to drop back and throw the football you know thirty times and you're not going to feel great about it. Uh, but TCU, man, uh, they're they're set up for success. I think they're a team that has staying power. And if you're asking me who's going to win the Big Twelve right now, I, I would definitely roll with what I've seen with TCU so far. And Pete's guy hasn't even played much yet. Quentin Johnson, right? Quentin Johnson. Yeah. He had four catches against Oklahoma, and none of them were particularly impactful. Um, it was it was funny. I was watching the the Dylan Gabriel clip this morning to to see if TCU's linebacker. Uh, I forgot, and if it was in the second quarter or the third quarter. So I was just I was just kind of googling it and looking around, and 
it was with nine minutes left in the second quarter when they already had 34 points. <laughs> like, that, like as much as I was looking at the clip, I was like, they had 34 points with nine minutes to go in the second quarter. I mean, that's, that's insane. Um, so look, like, I think we, we kind of called on the podcast last week, Reese, uh, TCU as the biggest mystery in college football. And, and they certainly revealed themselves as a high end big 12 contender. I think an authoritative performance in Lawrence, which I have confidence that they're going to be able to deliver because they just have an element of team speed that I don't think Kansas has seen yet. And I think they will eventually struggle with. Um, I think they can really, you know, put themselves right with Oklahoma state in, in Oklahoma state's been interesting too, because they've flown under the radar. Like one of those teams is going to be in the thicket of that playoff discussion now. And I, and I think it's in that big 12 right now. And I, you know, I think it's I think it's one of those two, right? I don't Oklahoma really... State. Listen, Oklahoma State and TCU, that like especially Oklahoma State too, they deserve to fly under the radar. When you play what you play to start the yeah, season, sure, that's like you. How how am I supposed to honestly rate you? But listen, I picked Oklahoma State this week because I like what I saw from Spencer Sanders in the first four games. I had no clue if it was going to translate. Like yeah. I just didn't know mm-hmm. because they're playing such bad competition. But you watch Oklahoma State versus Baylor. And I love what I see from the – He again, he is not a guy that's going to go through progressions and not going to pick you apart from the pocket. I don't have to ask him to do that. Spencer Sanders is going to be a, a read the field, take off and run. He, they're going to use his athletic ability like crazy to, to get him out in space and to run the football and to stay manageable situations. And, and they created some big plays. They had a big kickoff return, obviously, too, that I think really, really helped. But defensively, I think they played good, too. But I think – we had reason to say that about teams. I'm okay with that. I'm okay with people having doubts about teams until they play somebody. Yeah, and you give Oklahoma State and TCU maybe a little bit of a pass. Like, when you schedule Colorado and Arizona State five years ago or, or whatever it is, you know what I mean? There's always a joke in our game day offices of uh, Wyoming and, uh, you know, Maryland have agreed to a home and home in 2039, 2042. Like, that's just sort of the way the, the the system works. So Michigan, you're like, okay, you just bailed on UCLA. Like you, you've sort of earned any early season skepticism from your cupcakes. At least Oklahoma State had that home and home with Arizona State, and and obviously TCU played Colorado. You know, on paper that first Friday night, you're like, oh, okay, like they're, and I believe they went to Boulder too. Um, you're like, oh, it was okay. a decent you know, game for a long while too, by the way. Yeah, no, it was. Um, so at least like I I always honor intent. And sometimes if a team just ends up, you know, like I remember one year Ohio State played Cal, they scheduled it like during the, you know, Aaron Rodgers days when Cal was like a good West Coast team and they stunk at, you know, by the time, by the time the game, game played. So that's always like an interesting philosophical thing. But I think we get another key piece of information about TCU at Kansas this week. How do they handle, it'll be a hostile road environment. And I know if I had said Kansas and hostile road environment on an August podcast, you guys would have laughed me right off the thing, but like, they're going to be they're going to be generationally juiced there um, for for that for that game. So uh, it'll be interesting to see how they uh, how they respond. You're not really going to find out about a Sonny Dykes coach team until November because they do this a lot. Seven and zero to start last year, lost four or five. Year before that, start five and zero, lost three of five. Year before that, started seven and zero, lost three of five. In his first year at SMU, also lost three of five down the stretch. But they started poorly that year in his first year. So I'm I'm still skeptical about their ability to finish because of his track record, and it's his first year. I'm not saying he's a bad coach. I'm just saying that there. I don't know if it gets to the point where people get a little more comfortable playing them figure him out a little bit, slow it down, or if there's there's something else in the water there. But it's not a one-time thing. They have struggled down the stretch of seasons when he's been the head coach. And so we'll see. They're off to a great start. They're dynamic and fun to watch. And like you said, put 500 yards on Oklahoma in the first half. It was impressive, man. Uh, I'm, I'm slowing my roll on picking TCU to win the Big 12 or to play in the Big 12 championship game, at least for now. I'm um, I probably lean Oklahoma State and, uh, you know, Baylor's taking a hit for sure. But, um, you know, I, Oklahoma State might be, might be the well, most well-rounded You like Kansas State, team. Reese, early. You I know, do like Kansas. Like, I did like Kansas State. Write I was, them off. They're I, obviously, I, was, I was rattled by – now, maybe I shouldn't have been because I watched Tulane again the other night. I was rattled by the Tulane game. I, yeah. I just – you know, I didn't see it coming. 
the Kansas State loss, and I was like, man, I don't know. But, you know, maybe so. And Kansas State's going to have to gonna have to follow up too. So, Can I ask David Wheel one of question destiny. about TCU? Um, Wheel of Destiny. David, they, need a big, they need a big 12 Wheel of Destiny to spin that thing. Yeah. <laughs> David, in watching TCU's defense, I'm curious what you thought. They brought Gillespie in from Tulsa. It's like a, it's a little bit of like a 3-3-5 kind of a funky – odd deal it's a little different maybe than what Sonny's done at other stops um and they had a lot of success at Tulsa they actually changed their identity around their defense what have you thought of their defense so far and uh how they've how they've looked I I, have, I don't have a sense of like the dudes they have on that side of the ball well it's, it's interesting because Gary Patterson had that side for so long but they had really started to slip on that side big time and I, and I would say personnel wise they're not even close to what I'm used to seeing from them like I mean, you used to see first-round picks in the secondary pretty consistently. You used to see D-linemen up front that you could dominate. But I don't know because, again, Colorado's not my test. Like, Oklahoma's offense, like Dylan Gabriel, if he played the whole game, would have been really fun to see too, by the way, because once 11 came in, it was over. I mean, that game was that game was done. So I, I, I think it's – I know the offense is going to be ridiculous and be great. I think the defense – I, I got to wait and see when they play teams that are a little bit better. But – they're definitely different. They're definitely unique. And, um, but I, I still, the jury's way out on them. Are we going to have a general booty sighting at the state fair? Boy, I hope so. Well, I yes. So. But if you're talking about the Oklahoma quarterback, <laughs> there remains to be seen. <laughs> boo. Boo. He's oh, Oklahoma come on. State how can, how can you ask that question and then boo that response? It was too easy. I, I think Pat McAfee is going to be really excited about General Booty. That's my game day prediction for Saturday. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's, start that's going to be your lock of the week. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Our listeners should know who are way in the weeds uh, that he is the nephew, I believe, of the famous Booty family. Is that right? Um, John David so. Booty and Josh I think Booty. So. I believe Josh he's Booty, a nephew. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I yeah. believe he's a nephew of the uh, – the booties of the boot in Louisiana. The booties of the boot. The quarterbacking booties of the yes. boot. Yes. Yeah. A lot of booties. A lot of booties. <laughs> For sure. All right. There's some teams, David. I'm going to give you a, a list of teams that really have sort of season, pivotal season games coming up this weekend. It's going to really set the direction for what they're going to be uh, the rest of the year. Arkansas, after the oink doink and then you know the failed comeback against alabama mississippi state north carolina and miami you could probably say that for both teams but especially miami and byu at notre dame what's the most pivotal season swinging game in that group i, I think it's notre dame I, I think he had so much juice and just so much energy i, I think um I think they need to continue to win. I, I really do. I think they need to continue to be competitive, continue to put a good product on the field. I just think for the Irish, uh, they're playing a good team. BYU is not explosive. They're not a, a team that's going to put the fear of God in you, but they're a highly ranked team. you got a great opportunity to say, hey, look, we started off struggling. We rebounded. We beat North Carolina. Watch this team. Watch us grow. This is what we're going to be in the future. So for the long haul, I think it's big uh, for Notre Dame. It's an interesting game to use fear of God in. Um, I uh, I think that BYU and Notre Dame have a lot in common um, because they are not explosive and they are going, it, this is going to be a low scoring grinder that I think is going to come down to the last possession. I, I think it'll actually be a very good game and it's going to be a very good test of where Marcus Freeman's Notre Dame team is in terms of toughness, in terms of running the ball, in terms of the offense, embracing its identity, which is one of not exploding. And uh yeah, I'm actually I'm excited for uh, I'm excited for that game on Saturday night. I think it's going to be a really I think it's going to be a really interesting, hard hitting game. N Notre Dame's young tackles really struggled early. I sort of assumed that they would emerge as dominant forces, and they haven't. And now you've got a couple 19 year olds in Alton Fisher going up against men, right? That's what you have at BYU. So it's it's going to be it's going to be really interesting in uh, in Sin City to see uh, to see how how that unfolds late. I'm really interested to see North Carolina and Miami who had that when these two teams played in the preseason, that the best quarterback in the ACC would be playing, but he would be playing for North Carolina and not for Miami. Yeah, and the one struggling yeah. for his job would be playing for Miami. Yeah. Tyler Van Dyke, I, I, you're listen. going, 
they're going to start with him. And then I'm talking about Drake May, who's, of course, uh, for all yeah. of the problems on North Carolina's defense, Drake May's made up for a bunch of them when the Tar Heels have the ball. And, and we thought, I heard a lot of people automatically, like right away, Miami's going to be back. Miami's going to be back. Like, I, I what did, what did Cristobal do in Oregon that really just made you go, man, that's the guy that's going to turn this around really quickly. He's, like, he recruited well. He absolutely recruited well. But I think there's, there's, there's things to be desired about how they, how they game plan. I think there's things to be desired about how they coach things. Like, I think there's – I don't know. I, I want to see Miami. I think he's got a lot of uh, – you know, he's trying to create momentum. He's trying to create juice for him. But I, I don't know, man. He's got a lot to prove to me about this being a home run hire, this being the Miami's back, the U's excited, stuff like that. I think there's a lot they're going to have to prove to me first. The, the one thing I, I mentioned, Sonny Dykes, too, and look, these coaches make a lot of money, so we get to critique them. Something that was on brand for Cristobal is a face plant when you don't expect it. And and they've already delivered that early with uh, the loss to Middle Tennessee. But How about the I, Middle I Tennessee give, State I, coach, by the way? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hey, you gave us $1.5 million and averaged 1.6 yards a carry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rick Stock still has been around a long time. He could say – he can say that stuff. You, but I, do, I love it. I do extend some grace to Miami because, look, it's the first year. And, and same for Sonny. It's the first year. And so things happen. People buy in. They don't buy in. Guys are portaling in. They're portaling out. It's, uh, you know, it's a difficult thing and rare. I, I'm still waiting to see. Uh, USC had a little bit of adversity um, at Oregon State or a lot within the game. I'm waiting to see what happens, you know, when and if they lose a game, you know, when and if they have a game where, you know, maybe, you know, the receivers don't get the touches they want, or maybe there's a receiver other than Addison that wants more touches. He's not getting them. All of those things still waiting to see first year takes a little while. So um, I don't know. I, I guess I'm just a skeptic that way sometimes. So, but I, but I am extending some grace on the, on the crystal ball face plant because, you know, they, I got caught with their pants down. It happens. You know, I mean, people lose games sometimes. Well, two, did they lose two, two things? Or did they get dominated? They got dominated. They got dominated. I'm about to say, there's a difference between losing a game and getting punched in the face by Mississippi State. Just, I'm just going to say that. There's a difference. Middle Tennessee. The, uh, yeah, the Middle so Tennessee, interesting whatever. thought on Grace Reese. You certainly are a gracious guy. You would extend Grace. The situation that set up Mario Cristobal coming from Oregon to Miami was completely graceless. What they did to Manny Diaz, how they hung him to dry, how they whacked True. him out. It was cold-blooded business. So, and, and look, they they got the hire they wanted, and this is a billion-dollar business, so I'm not going to go old-timey on you and all that stuff. But I'm going to say this. When you enter Miami on those circumstances, you are susceptible to those same whims and circumstances, right? That's true. If you yeah, come for big money. Now, I'm not saying Mark Christopher's in trouble. I'm not intimating that. But if I'm Josh Gaddis right now, I'm nervous, right? Because yeah, those same yeah. people – who are paying and who paid massive buyouts and moved mountains to get me and are, you know, there's a, a huge cash influx in Miami. Miami is not a patient place. Like they are just not going to say, Hey, that looked great. Mario run it back. Exactly the same. And mm -hmm. is, is the, the failure this season to see some development from Tyler Van Dyke. Is that Tyler Van Dyke's fault? Or is that the coaching staff's fault? Well, I know what the, the Miami crowd is going to think. Like, yeah. you know, yeah. we're in a, yeah, we're in, look, he's a talented dude. And I've had a lot of NFL people tell me that. So mm -hmm. all I'm saying is when you enter through such a period of volatility, you are exposing yourself to that volatility going forward. You, you are not hermetically sealed from the same whims and spasms that brought you there. So hermetically um, sealed. Okay. Yeah. The, the second, the second point is this is what I want to know from Miami what are you like? What are you going to look like? And what is your identity on offense? Mario Cristobal went after Kendall Bryles, who was, you know, who obviously runs like a, a hyper tempo offense, you know, the, the Baylor offense as it's known. He also went after Josh Gaddis, who basically ran Wisconsin's offense or Stanford's offense via Matt Weiss, um, who, who came in. And, and I don't, if you say right now, what is the Miami offense? There's not an answer. And I don't think there was a vision set on what the offense was going to be at Miami. 
And I think that's going to end up being a problem going forward, because if you don't know what you are and you can't recruit to what you are, that that's going to be an issue. So I, I will be curious, like, look, they play North Carolina. We know exactly what we're going to see from North Carolina, right? Like you, like it is a clear and distinct identity that Phil Longo has brought there. Maybe too clear and distinct for some folks sometimes because they, you know, sometimes the offense takes away from the defense, but there is, there is an identity and a vision. And I've yet to see that at Miami. One other game that I think is really important for momentum of a program is Arkansas. Uh, Arkansas is on the road at Mississippi State. Then they go to BYU. They've got a trip to Auburn, whatever you think of that. They have Ole Miss later. If they if they lose to Mississippi State and then a trip to BYU coming, that's four losses. And, you know, an Ole Miss, too, coming in. I mean, you're looking at um, you're looking at the possibility of really taking a step back. Um, so I think it's a really, really big game for Arkansas on Saturday. Yeah. And, and I think they they did what they needed to do this offseason. I, I thought they won the offseason by keeping Bryles, like, or keeping Bryles and keeping Odom. Like I think that I thought that was a really, really big deal. But I mean, their pass defense has been a nightmare. Um, offensively, they're they're very one dimensional. They they don't throw the football well, and it's whether it's the receivers or the quarterback. You you pick what you want. Traylon Burks was there; he could do it a lot better, and Burks made more plays. But you know, you're going to ask KJ Jefferson to carry the load a whole season with those names of the schedule that you just talked about physically to hold up. You're asking him to do a lot. That defense better grow up and better grow up fast. Yeah, and we didn't even talk about Oklahoma, Texas. Before we get out of here, David, uh, what else are you doing? What what else are you doing besides grinding over college football film? Uh, still coach, still coaching football. Uh, How are we doing? How are we doing? We are. I, we are. Number, I saw young are, Nicholas make some big time hits on your phone the other day. That's uh, that that's an impressive. Yeah, he, thing. he got lucky. He got lucky. No, and fell he did. a couple hits. Um, right. Nah, but we we definitely uh, we we are five. We are five and zero. Oh. We are uh, number two in the state right now with North Oco- the North Oconee Titans. We are, we are doing well. We dropped, we dropped a 70 burger last week, but that was last week. And that means absolutely nothing. Um, <laughs> but just doing a little bit of that, just finished up some flag football with baby girl with Leah. And now we, uh, now we're all doing? college football. Hey, the what, last thing I do want to say though, is I'm jacked about UCLA, Utah. I think that that would be awesome this weekend. Um, I think that would be really fun to watch, but like, Chip Chip has got some fun pieces, and that Jake Bobo kid is an absolute stud. He is a problem. Like, I don't, I can't believe we didn't know more about him in the past. Pride of Massachusetts, David, speak for yourself. Yeah. Pride of the state uh, of Massachusetts by a Duke. And Duke. I love uh, Duke. I, I know, but I'm just saying, don't act like he was like a prized recruit that everybody got and went, oh my God, we got Jake Bobo. So, I mean, Massachusetts just stuff. churns out skill guys. All right. We churn <laughs> out skill guys here. It's an what? assembly what? line. It's, it's a, you know, it's a cankle it's, it's like, line. Yeah. All those cankles <laughs> up north and those are just, just, just beautiful. Do a great job. It's, with it's that, like baby. Dade County North, man. I don't know what you're talking about. And, and no. that's that's really interesting that you're excited about that because I'm sure that the old Rose Bowl is going to be a buzz with excitement with tens of people in the stands to <laughs> to watch. Golly, mm-hmm. between Troy Aikman, you and Kurt, good lord, that poor UCLA fan base. Good gosh, what what fan base? Actually, we I contacted both of UCLA's ardent fans and asked them to come on the podcast, and both uh, said they had a, an appointment with a subboard operator or something. So. I'm excited for Chip. It's Chip's so fun to watch call plays and he's done it for long enough. And I think he's got a sneaky good team. When you look at like what they have in the tight end room in Mm -hmm. DTR, like they are designed a little bit like an NFL team and they're built not to lose. Does that, does that, that's how Chip kind of operates. This is not Oregon chip. This is not crazy chip, but they are that that'll be a fascinating chess match with Utah. I expect another sort of low, low scoring game. Um, from there, we're obviously going to have our eye on the Utes because I think they're on our bigger picture slate for potential uh, potential destinations for uh, the following mm-hmm. Saturday. Because with the with the yep. Trojans coming to uh, Trojans coming to town, so no, that's going to be uh, that's going to be a heck of a, a heck of a nightcap. And look, LA is an event town, right? Like you you need an event to get people to show up. It will be an interesting litmus test whether Utah is an event. Not. I, I say I don't no. see a lot. Of, I don't see I don't, a lot don't of optimism uh, from the uh, from but, our pod brother. But you know what else? I mean, I may be wrong. I think that is just fine with Chip. 
let him yeah. call the plays, let him let Pete Thamel talk about him on a podcast. And that way you don't have to put up with a lot of the other stuff that he doesn't always find as appealing. Although, you know, the funny thing about it is he came on game day when we were there last year and he, he's fantastic, but that doesn't mean he always loves doing all the media stuff and all the hype and the attention. So he probably he does. Okay I hate it. you media people. <laughs> you're one of Ship. them this is the thing this is a great thing is all these former players like to act like they're not in the media but they are you're a media guy now Polly. more people of of the demographic that you crave that you crave you always say young 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 those people know you as a game day guy he's a guy on game day hey did he yeah, play? I'm, he defi- prob- I'm definitely he not was, I'm, he was probably I'm definitely a not receiver. seeing a football player these guys, guys weren't alive when i played football yeah <laughs> there's probably an H back, maybe, maybe I don't know. Some I'm three tech, three technique, baby. Put the hand in the dirt, baby. Let's go. Uh, all right, gentlemen, going to be fun in Larry Town. Pete's already gotten word from a scout about the place to go get ribs. Uh, about a thirty minute drive. Maybe we'll maybe we'll check that out. So, David, I'll have so, fun with that. Y'all kill it. I'm so pleased. I'm so pleased with your internet. Congratulations on uh, coming into the high speed world the up-tempo offense of communication, as it were. Yeah, well, you know, it got, the good thing was it got me out of a lot of work a lot of times. I didn't have to worry. Oh, your internet sucks. We can't get you on. I don't have that excuse <laughs> Thanks for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+. Plus.